So, you want to build a pixel art game. You have one important decision to make. Who is the main hero of your game going to be? Is your hero a monster hunter, effortlessly cutting through hordes of terrifying night creatures? Or maybe you want your pixel art game to be more relaxing. Let your players chill while fishing. Is your hero an agile cyborg warrior saving the world? Or maybe your hero is just minding their own, building a money-making business. Will your pixel art game have a single hero or a group of unique adventurers in an RPG fantasy world? Let your imagination loose, because today we will learn how to make hundreds of different characters, generate a sprite sheet for them and animate them in a game world. We are learning how to create a more robust but still beginner-friendly code that can serve as a base for multiple different game types. We are going to have fun creating in different hero characters. We will learn a simple way to implement multi-layered grid-based game world. We will put our hero in there, we animate it and give it a smooth grid-based movement. We learn how to define a collision map and many other things. I packed a lot into this class. It was originally meant to be split into three separate episodes. I hope you get a lot of value. I've never covered these techniques before. I tried to explain everything as carefully as possible. If you want to see what I do with it next, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. Also, if you're new here, you can say hi to me in the comments. I link main.js script file. I will put JavaScript code in here. Console log just to test if everything is working. Yes, JavaScript is connected. I will create a small set of constants that will be needed in many different places all over the code base. I will put them up here. Later today we will learn how to export and import them around between different script files to keep the code well organized, modular and easy to navigate. This is a grid based game. The most important number today is 32, the width and height of a single tile. Game world will be a grid of tiles, where each tile is 32 times 32 pixels. And for now, I will make the world 15 columns wide and 20 rows tall. We will also use these values to pre-calculate the game area. Game width will be tile size times columns. 32 times 15 is 480. Game height will be tile size times rows. 32 times 20 is 640. We have a game area of 480 times 640 pixels. We only want to draw the game and run animations after all the important resources are fully loaded and available. Resources like images, script files, HTML elements. Only when everything is loaded, we will run the code inside this code block. In here, I will start by setting up my canvas element. I create a variable called canvas. I pointed towards the HTML canvas element using its ID from line 18 here. Now I want a drawing context, CTX. I take my canvas reference and from it I call a special built-in getContext method and I pass it 2D. This is how you set up HTML canvas for drawing. Easy. I set width property on canvas to game width from line 4. Canvas changed size so I know it's all working. I set height property to game height from line 5. Click the like if you want me to make more projects like this. The most important thing today is the grid. I create a helper function and I call it draw grid. From here I want to draw the entire game grid made out of 15 columns and 20 rows. I start by filling a simple rectangle at coordinates 1020, 50 pixels wide and 100 pixels tall. I call draw grid to run the code inside. That works. Each cell in the grid is 32 times 32. So let's use these values here. This is X, Y, width and height. If I move horizontally by the increments of tile size, we are traveling through the grid from left to right. I can do the same thing vertically. Now that we understand that, let's draw all the cells at once. This is the most important technique to learn, how to draw a 2D grid using nested for loops, a loop inside of another loop. It will be an important element in everything we do today, from grid-based hero movement to collision maps. To draw a 2D grid, we need two nested for loops. The outer loop will cycle over rows in the grid from top to bottom of game area. The inner for loop will cycle over the columns from left to right. This allows us to travel around the entire game area cell by cell from left to right, 
row by row from top to bottom. Each time we enter a new cell in the grid, we will stroke a rectangle to visualize it. Horizontal position of the rectangle is the first argument, the distance from the left. The second argument is the vertical position, the distance of this particular rectangle of this cell from the top. Then we pass it width and height. We already know that if we increase horizontal position by the increments of tile size, we can travel around the grid horizontally. So as the for loops run over columns, let's map those cells around the grid using call value from the inner loop. And as rows increase from top to bottom, we use that row variable to map individual rows. To draw a 2D grid, we use nested for loops, a loop inside of another loop. We start in the top left corner of canvas, row 0, column 0. We enter the inner loop and we map cells on row 0 from left to right. When we reach 15, we exit the inner loop, outer loop increases row by 1, we enter the next row and the inner loop maps the columns on that row again. We reach the end, we increase row by 1, we map another row. We repeat this process until we covered the entire game area, all the rows and all the columns. If you understand the logic I just explained, it will be so much easier for you to make 2D grid-based games. I can change column and row values here, and because we are setting canvas size to these values, and because we are centering canvas in the middle of the page with CSS, the entire game will resize for us. I will stick to 15 columns and 20 rows for now. This will also work if you are using a tile map of a different size. For example, 16 by 16 or 64 by 64 are very common tile sizes and you will find many art assets online compatible with that. I will do tiles 32 times 32 for this project. In my project folder, I create a subfolder called scripts. Inside, I create another script file I call world.js. The job of this file will be to hold all data about the game world and all helper methods and properties that relate to it. Custom class I call world. Constructor will hold a separate property for each level. Let's say this is all the data we need to create level 1. It will be an object. In here, I can put all tile map layers, environmental art assets, animation data, and collision maps. Everything we need to draw and animate level 1. We will expand on this later in this episode. First, I want to take that draw grid function we just wrote, and I want to put it in a method on this world class. I take everything inside the draw grid function, I cut it, and I paste it in here. I can delete all of this. Now I'm using rows, calls, and tile size constants here. Those variables are stored up here in main.js. I can just duplicate those variables in each file, but imagine you have a massive game with hundreds of files. We want these values to be coming from one place and to be used all around the code base, always pointing to that one source. We don't want code duplication because that could be a nightmare to maintain. So how do I point towards this tile size variable from inside world.js file? I will export this. I also need to export columns and rows like this. You will probably get an error at this point. Export import syntax requires modules. So I come here and I set type to module. Modules allow us to break code into separate files and export and import functions and variables around the code base wherever they are needed. Exporting and importing pieces of code makes it easier to maintain a code base. If you want to build larger projects, it's important to understand how to use modules. And don't worry, it's easy. <laughs> right now, I'm not working in any kind of custom dev environment. I simply write my code in my code editor, and I opened my project by clicking on index.html, and I'm running that in my browser. I'm using Visual Studio Code Editor, and this is Google Chrome. You don't see the full browser window because I'm cropping it with my screen recording software. JavaScript modules allow us to export and import code between different script files. In modern browsers, this is restricted by something called cross-origin resource sharing, course. Certain things are allowed only if they come from the same source, code from the same server, 
If I just have my files in a folder on my local computer, that is not considered same origin and course will block any exports and imports. We need to put our project inside a folder somewhere online or we need to work in some kind of development environment. This is JavaScript, so there are many ways to set up a local dev environment, to set up a local server. The easiest way is this. You don't have to do this part if you are already using some kind of a local server setup. If you are not, let me show you a very simple way to do it. I'm using VS Code Editor. I find extensions panel. For you, it might be somewhere else. Mine is here. It opens a massive repository of plugins and add-ons that are available for my code editor. I will search for one called Live Server. It's this one. You can see mine is already installed. For you, it will say install here. You know that live server was successfully installed if you see this go live button down here. You might have to close your code editor completely and reopen it for the button to appear. Once you have the button down here, you need to point VS Code to a project folder. The folder somewhere on your local machine where index.html file sits. I do that by going to file and open folder and I navigate to the project folder on my computer. Then we can click go live and that's it. I click go live and we are running our project on a local server and we are free from course restrictions. Now we can export and import pieces of code, variables and functions between different script files. You might see a message that says live reload enabled in browser console. It means that whenever you make changes to any of the project files and you save them, in VS Code I save them using keyboard shortcut command plus s, when you save changes to any of the files it will automatically reload the browser window and it will show you the latest updated version of the project so we don't have to press the refresh button. I'm exporting rows here on line 3. I need it here on line 6. My code editor will automatically write the import line. If I delete one or two letters and then I select it and press tab. For some reason it does it wrong because it needs to say main.js up here. It doesn't matter, I can just write all of this manually. I also import calls and tile size from the same file. This is the import line. If your code editor doesn't automatically pre-fill this, it doesn't matter, you can just write it yourself. Now I want to run this method to draw the grid from here. Notice I'm exporting my world class. In main.js I create a constant variable I call for example world and it will be equal to new world, an instance of world class we are exporting in the other file. My code editor writes the import line for me but it does it wrong again so I fix it by saying world.js. Notice that in my project folder I have a subfolder called scripts and world.js file is placed in there. Now I call world.drawgrid. In console I see that it needs context, ctx, because we are using it here on line 10. I'm not going to import that variable here. Instead we will make sure drawgrid method expects context here. And when I call drawgrid I will pass it this ctx from line 11 as an argument. Perfect, we are drawing a grid. So this is how you make your code more modular by splitting it into multiple script files. And we also know how to export and import variables and classes between the files. Nice job. Let me know in the comments if this is your first time using export import. It's a very good and useful thing to understand. Inside script subfolder, I create a new JavaScript file called hero.js. Inside we export class hero. The job of this class is to store properties and behaviors of the player character. I give it a draw method. I will create another file I call gameObject.js. Inside I export class gameObject spelled like this. In hero.js I say class hero extends gameObject. I need to import game object class up top like this from gameObject.js. So why am I doing this? We have a parent game object class and I'm extending it into a child class I call hero. We can have other child classes like enemy, power up, projectile, and all of the classes will be extending game object. 
Hero is a type of game object, but also enemy can be a type of game object. When I structure my code like this, I can put all the properties and behaviors that are shared for all game objects on the parent game object class, and then all heroes, enemies and projectiles automatically inherit that, so I don't have to define those things individually and separately for each one. And then, on the child hero class, I define only properties and behaviors that are specific for the player character. Let's say that all game objects have physics, so collision detection will be on the main game object, but only the hero character will be controlled by keyboard, so that logic will be on the hero child class only. I delete the draw method from hero class. Because of the fact that hero extends game object, when we call draw from hero, and JavaScript can't find it here, it will follow the prototype chain to the parent class, the game object, and it will find the draw method there. All game objects will have a rectangular hitbox for collisions and some animated sprite sheet to give it some nice graphics. So draw method here will expect context to specify which canvas we want to draw on. Inside I call built-in fill rectangle method. It will need x, y, width and height. I want the game object to take up exactly one cell in the game grid, so width and height will be tile size. We will import it from here. We use dot dot slash because we are in script subfolder. This will take us back one level and from there we access main.js file. And I use tile size for width and for height of the rectangle. So this is the parent game object class that contains shared properties for all game objects. Hero is one type of game object, it extends game object class. Notice I'm exporting hero class here. Constant hero is an instance of hero class. I use it here and I need to import it here like this. Import class hero from scripts slash hero.js. Notice that hero class doesn't have draw method, but I can still call hero.draw because that method will be inherited from its parent game object class. If I do this, I get an error that says must call super constructor on derived class before accessing this. What does this mean? Derived class is another way to say child class. Hero is a class derived from game object class. So this is the parent class, it has a constructor here. This is the derived class, it also has a constructor and the error is telling me that I have to run code inside the class constructor of game object first. I do that by saying super and brackets here. This line means run all the code inside the constructor of the parent game object class first, then you can do some other things in here. I know these constructors are empty, but we will use them for some cool things soon. But before that, you can see that we are drawing the hero as a black rectangle. Again, if we move by multiples of tile size, the hero moves around the game grid. X and Y position define where it sits in the grid. I'm passing game object X, Y, width and height here, but in reality each game object will have its own values. Those values will be passed as arguments to the class constructor. If the constructor expects the arguments like this, we need to make sure they come in the same order when we create an instance of that class. There is a better way to do this. Look at this. I can wrap all of this in curly brackets, so I'm passing it an object, one single object as an argument, and it will try to destructure game, sprite, position and scale from that object if the data is there. If it can't find any position data in there, for example, it will still work and the order of these also doesn't matter. Now I convert these into class properties like this. So this is my configuration object I pass to class constructor and game, sprite, position and scale are supported configuration. Because our game can have a wide variety of game objects, not only the hero. We might not always need all of them and if we write the code like this, we can only pass each object what it actually needs. I can also give these some default values. Let's say we are creating game object and for some reason we don't pass it any sprite data. We want sprite property to fall back on some default values. I want sprite to be an object that gives us x, y, width and height of the crop. For values we need to crop a single sprite frame and the image we will be cropping from. 
Double question mark is something called nullish coalescing operator. It returns the first argument that is not null or undefined. So let's say we didn't pass it any sprite value. This will be undefined. So this operator will automatically choose this object, which sets crop to 0, 0 position and width and height will be tile size and image we are cropping from just an empty string for now. We will get back to this. Same with position. If we don't pass it any position and this is undefined or null, it will set position to object with X and Y properties set to zero. Scale will be a custom value destructured from the configuration object or it will default to one. So instead of passing class constructor each argument separately, we pass all of them inside a single configuration object. JavaScript will try to destructure what it can find. If it can't find what it's looking for, it will set it to undefined. If we want the undefined properties to have default values, we define them here like this, using this special operator. So I need to pass it the object here and here, but it can be completely empty like this. And I pass it here. Perfect, all still works. So I'm passing hero an empty configuration object. It expects it here and it passes that along to its superclass constructor. That object then goes here and JavaScript will attempt to get game, sprite, position and scale from that object. But because that object we passed is empty right now, all of these will be set to undefined. So these class properties will get created with default values that we defined here. So we know this object gets default position x0, y0. So I can use those values here. This dot position x is the number of the column. I still have to multiply that times tile size to place it in the grid. Vertically, it will be this dot position y times tile size. It jumped to position 0, 0. That works. We know this is the supported configuration. Let's pass it some of these values. We don't have to pass it all of them. For example, I can pass it only key value pair for position. Let's say x100, y200. Then we take that position and we pass it along here. And at this point, position passed here is no longer undefined and it takes over and overrides the default. I have to remember I'm multiplying times tile size here, so hero is far off screen now. I want the hero to sit in column 5 and row 5. We count from 0 in this case. Column 10, 13, row 15. This works. Let's do 2, 2 for now. Okay, so class constructor, we are passing it a configuration object that has position property. We are passing that information along to the super class constructor here. And because this is not undefined, it takes priority and hero is drawn at position 2, 2. If it was undefined, it will default to position 0, 0. I hope this makes sense. Let's pass along all of it. Game, sprite, position and scale, like this. When we create hero using the new keyword, it will try to destructure these values and pass them along. Or it will pass undefined. Before we finish this, we need some keyboard controls. Inside my project folder in a scripts subfolder, I create another file I call input.js. Inside I export class input. Constructor will have a single property called this.keys and it will be an array. I know a lot of you like to use JavaScript sets here for this as a data type, but sometimes, like in this case, good old arrays are better. Let me show you why. One of the reasons is that I'm not entirely sure that every programming language has an equivalent of set, but every programming language has something similar to array. So if somebody's following along, writing this code in a different programming language, keeping it simple and using arrays is gonna make it easier for them. Inside the constructor, I will apply an event listener for key down event and also for key up. These listeners will be automatically applied when I create an instance of input class using the new keyword, because at that point, all the code inside class constructor gets executed line by line. I want to use this dot inside these callback functions because I need to be adding and removing values from this dot keys. To do that, I have to use arrow functions here, or I have to bind this. 
Otherwise, this keyword inside these callbacks will point to the window object, but I need it to point to input object so that it can find this.keys property on it. For that reason, I'm using arrow function syntax here. Arrow functions in JavaScript inherit this keyword from the parent scope. Cool, so we are exporting input class here. I close all the other files for a while. Here I create an instance of input class. I need to import it up here. The new keyword executes the constructor, which means these event listeners also get applied. When I press keys on the keyboard, the auto-generated event object is being console locked. I'm interested in this key property. You can see I pressed arrow down. I can console lock e.key directly. I check how the keys I will need are spelled here. I console lock the key that is pressed and released. I need a space here. I write two helper methods, key pressed and key released. Let's say I want to listen for two sets of keyboard inputs, arrow keys and WSAD arrows. I don't care about other keys and I will ignore them for now. On key down, I say if key that was pressed is arrowed up or if the key that was pressed to lowercase is w, this will make sure it works for both lowercase and uppercase w. If one of these is true, we will take this.keys from line 3 and we will push a value inside, representing upwards direction. I will put these into variables to make sure we have consistent spelling and we can also easily rename them if needed. So variable left is equal to string that says left. We also do right up and down. If we press arrow up or w, we push up the text string into this.keys array. On key up, we call key released and we remove up value from this.keys. So on key pressed, we will expect a key value. For example, I'm putting it up here, so this. I take this.keys array and I push up inside. Actually, I will use unshift because I want the last key that was pressed to be in the beginning of the array. This is important because the key with index zero will always be the one with highest priority. But at the same time, we hold a queue of keys if we hold multiple ones and we want to know in which order they were pressed and released. I only want to add the value to the array if the value is not already in there because we don't want duplicates of the same value. Index of returns minus one if the element we pass to it is not in the array. So if up is not in the array, put it inside the array to the beginning. I console log the key value on key pressed. I delete this one. I console log this dot keys array. Okay, when I press up arrow or W repeatedly, it is added to the array only once. This is working. I need to check the index of the key we released twice in this code block, so I might as well put it in a variable. Index is this.keys index of the key that was released. If the key that was released is in the array, we get that index value, position of the key in the array. If it's not present in the array, index of method will return minus one. We call splice method. This method is used to change contents of an array. I pass it the index of the element I want to remove and I want to remove one element at this index. I put the same console log here. When I press arrow up or W, add up to the array. When I release the key, this.keys array is empty again. Perfect. I do else if here. I have to be careful about brackets when I do this. If the key that was pressed is arrow down or S, we call key pressed and pass it down from line four. Arrow left or A is key pressed left. Arrow right or letter D is key pressed right. I expand the window so I can see the syntax better. Okay, so the same thing inside key up event listener like this, but instead of key pressed, we call key released. On key down, we call key pressed. That method checks if the key is already in the array. 
and if it's not there, it will add it to the beginning. I want the most recent key that was pressed to always be up front at index 0 in the array, in case we pressed multiple ones. This will allow us to execute the directions in the correct order. On key up event, we call key released method. That method will check the index of the key that was released. If index is minus 1, it means the element is not in the array. We return and stop the rest of this code block from running. If the element is in the array, we call splice, remove an element at that index. We want to remove one element at that index. Key pressed, if it's not there, add it. Key released, if it's there, remove it. Always add to the beginning to keep the order of keys if multiple ones are pressed. I can see in console that it works as I press arrow keys and WSAD. I remove this dot keys from here and I remove this entire console log. I will keep this one for now just so that we can see in console what keys I'm pressing. One last piece of our input handling system. I create a getter called last key. Get binds an object property to a function. That function will be called when a property is looked up. What that means is simply when I say input dot last key from somewhere in the code base, it will give me the key that sits at index zero in this dot keys array. Input dot last key will give me that most recent key that was pressed. This dot keys can hold multiple keys at the same time, but we want to react to the most recent one. When that recent key is released while we are still holding the previous key, it will shift to position zero in the array and it will take over. Input class has this dot keys property. Here we basically convert arrow keys and WSAD keys into these four values, left, right, up, and down. And we put that directional data inside this dot keys array. When we press a key, if it's not in the array, we add it. On release, if the directional information is in the array, we remove it. Calling input dot last key will give me the most recent direction up, down, left or right. I can call it from this instance of input class. Before I do that, let's organize this code in some kind of a root class. I will call it game. Let's put all of these inside. Game will have this dot world property equal to new world. This dot hero will be new hero, same as we did before. This dot input will be new input. I need to make sure I'm exporting input class in input.js and I'm importing it from input.js up top in this file. I give game class a custom render method. From there I call world.drawgrid and hero.draw. Now I can create an instance of the game class using the new keyword and from there I call render, passing it context from line 13. And here I have to use this dot, this dot. Perfect, this is much better. Right now, we are drawing the game only on the first page load. We want to update and redraw all game objects over and over to create an illusion of movement. Custom function I call animate. I use built-in request animation frame to call this method again for the next repaint. I put this up top to queue the next frame as soon as possible. Basically, every time we call animate, we update and redraw the game and we call animate again for the next animation frame. I call it like this to call the first animation loop. If I put console log in here, we can see we are already animating. Perfect. Now I can give hero an update method to move it around. I can say if this.game.input.lastkey coming from input class here and the getter called last key down here on line 44, we are accessing it through this.game that's pointing to this object and this input property here. We know that hero takes a configuration object and it will try to get that reference from there to use it here. So here, where I create an instance of hero class, I will pass it game property and I set it to this because we are inside this game class. I'm passing it a reference pointing to this entire game object. This will allow me to access all the methods and properties that sit on the root game class from inside here, including this dot input from line 24 here, which is exactly what I need. 
I say if input dot last key, which means the element at index zero inside keys array sitting on the input class, if it's up, notice I'm saying up as a text string, not the up variable from before. We console log hero moving up. Here I take this dot hero and I call this new update method. When I press up arrow or W, we get the console log. Nice. Instead of duplicating these text values that say left, right, up and down and having to make sure I spell them exactly the same in different places around the code base, I will reference the actual variables themselves. I export left, right, up and down. And here, instead of having to make sure this value matches what I wrote inside input.js, I use the variable up. My code editor writes the input line and for some reason it does it correctly this time, including .js. I'm not entirely sure why it doesn't always do it. I'm importing up, using it here, and when I press up arrow key or W, it still does the console log. Great. How about I say this.positionY minus minus, making it move up by one cell in the grid. Else, if last key is down, position y plus plus to make it move down. Again, I need to make sure we are importing down here on line two. Else if last key is left or right, I import them from here like this. Left is position x minus minus, right is position x plus plus. If I press arrow keys or WSAD, the hero moves and leaves trails. Hero moves very fast, so it's easy to make it move off screen. We will fix that soon. The hero is leaving trails like it's a snake game. It's because we see old paint, the previous animation frames. If I want to see only the current animation frame, I can clear a rectangle and I can delete old paint between every animation frame. Alternatively, we can do something else. I comment this out, so we are leaving trails again. I go to index.html and I create img element here. You can download background level one, PNG, in the resources section below. I put it into my project folder inside images subfolder I just created, and I point source argument towards it here. I give it an ID of background level one, I create a diff with a class of assets. I put the image inside and I give that assets diff display none. This will hide everything inside that diff. I don't want to draw the image element on the web page. I'm just putting the image here to load it into memory and I want to draw that image with JavaScript on canvas. In world.js, we can create image that looks exactly like this using a tile map technique we learned in another class. I will link it below if you want to learn everything about tile maps and 2D camera. In that class, we learned how to create data arrays for each layer of the game world and how to draw those particular frames from the tile map to create the game world. We can have as many layers here as we want. For example, it's an island, so we would have some water layer. On top of that, there would be a ground layer, there could be objects layer, clouds layer, and so on. Alternatively, we can also mix it with some larger images. I created this image from a tile map in a free software called Tiled, and I exported the entire thing as a PNG image. Tiled also exports JavaScript data array that we can easily plug in here, and it's compatible with the other episodes, but for now let's focus on something else. I just want to quickly create a world map that matches my game grid. Level 1 object will contain everything we need to draw level 1 in the game. We can have as many levels as we want. It will have background layer property and I point it towards that image we included in index.html. I create a custom method I call draw background. It will expect context. Inside I call built in canvas draw image method. It expects at least three arguments, the image we want to draw, and x and y coordinates where to draw it. Now I can come here and say this.world.drawBackground and I pass it CTX. Look how it exactly matches my game grid. 
If I comment it out, hero leaves trails if it moves, but when the background image is being redrawn for every animation frame, it is drawn on top of the old paint, so it effectively deletes the old paint for me. I want the hero to be able to walk around and behind some objects, so I also create a matching foreground layer. You can download it in the resources section below. I put it inside images subfolder in my project, and here I reference it inside the assets diff, which means the image will be automatically hidden. I create a property called foreground layer, and I create a draw foreground method like this. I want the foreground to be in front of the hero, so I will draw it after I draw hero, like this. Foreground layer image contains the tops of the trees and the hero will be able to walk behind them. The bases of the trees will be solid impassable obstacles and the tops will be something we can walk behind and around. If I comment out the background layer, we can see that hero is actually behind the tops of the trees. Hero moves too fast now. I want to create smooth grid-based movement where the character always sticks to a cell in the grid, but it will move between the cells smoothly. We will learn how to write code that always checks the cell where the hero wants to move, the destination cell, and if the cell is free and if it's possible to stand there, we will calculate a series of animation steps to move the hero inside that cell. The character will be able to walk around the game world smoothly, but it will never stop between cells. It will always finish the move to the target position in the grid and it will stick to the target cell. Knowing how to implement this in a simple way that I'm about to teach you is useful for so many things and we will use it to define borders and solid cells in the game world using something called collision map. It will look something like this. We can't move into the blue cells. Those are solid and impassable. We will get to that soon. This is our hero class. It extends game object. I will probably want other types of game objects to use this behavior and move around the grid. Probably enemies or maybe there will be some wildlife, some animals walking around the forest as well. So I will put this logic on the parent game object class so that it can be easily shared among all object types. To implement smooth grid-based movement, we will need the position of the object in the grid and we also need destination position, position in the grid where the object wants to move. On the first load, destination position will be the same as the current position. To animate the move between the cells, we need to be aware of the distance the object needs to travel. Again, this will have horizontal and vertical component. Move towards method will be a custom method that will take the destination position and speed and it will calculate a step to make the object move towards its destination. We will call this method from here, from update method on hero class. This method will run once for each animation frame. We will give it two helper variables, next x and next y. These variables will hold destination position, like this. Then we want a distance value distance that is left to travel after move towards method between the current position and the destination position happened. I give hero some speed, because we need it here, maybe two for now. I'm using destination position that we are storing here, but we are not taking it from here directly. We are passing that as an argument from hero. This will make the method more independent. Don't worry about that for now. We want the object to move towards its destination position, so first we will calculate horizontal distance to travel. It will be the distance between horizontal destination position and horizontal current position. Distance to travel y will be the difference between destination position and the current position where the object is right now on the vertical y-axis. We want to calculate the distance between two points in a 2D space, between destination position and the current position. We can use Pythagoras theorem formula, where this side of the imaginary right triangle is distance to travel x, this side is distance to travel y, and we want to calculate the hypotenuse, the longest side of the right triangle opposite to the right angle. That will be the actual distance between these two positions and keep in mind that they can sit anywhere in relation to each other, so we can potentially be going into negative values as well. Pythagoras theorem formula is c squared is equal 
to a squared plus b squared, which means that c is a square root of a squared plus b squared. This formula will give us the distance between destination position and the current position, and it is perfectly fine to use. Alternatively, because this is JavaScript, we have a built-in method that does these calculations behind the scenes. It's called math.hypotenuse. This method also takes this side and this side of the right triangle and it gives us the length of hypotenuse, which is the actual distance between these two points in a 2D space. This is a very common technique used in many 2D games and animation projects, so it's good to be a little bit familiar with it. So now we resolve that movement by calculating the next step, by how much will the object move towards its destination position, just for this one animation frame, for this one run of move towards method. We know that the object is moving at a specific speed. If the distance that is left to travel is less than speed, let's say we are moving 2 pixels per second, and we are 2 pixels or less away from the destination, we will just snap to the final position and we will end the move by setting position x and y to destination position x and y. Else, meaning we still have more than 2 pixels to go, we will calculate the size of a step we want to take towards destination position. Step x, the horizontal step, is the ratio between horizontal distance to travel and the actual distance between these two points. We know that distance is the hypotenuse and distance to travel is this side of the triangle. This will always be less than this. So this value will always be a number between minus one and plus one, because this can be to the left or to the right. If it's minus a negative value, we will be moving to the left. If it's a positive value, we will be moving to the right. This is a normalized vector. It will give us a very small number that is pointing us towards the destination position on the horizontal x-axis. It's telling us if we need to move to the left or to the right horizontally to get closer to the destination. Step y is the ratio between distance to travel y and the actual distance between this and this. Again, if it's negative, we have to move up. If it's positive, we move down. So we have these two normalized vectors. This one is telling us which direction to move horizontally to get to the destination, this one vertically. The combination of these values will give us the final direction towards destination position. So we simply add this step x value to the current position x of the object and we multiply that times object's movement speed. We are scaling the movement vector here Keep in mind that this can be plus or minus value, and multiplication will preserve that. I also scale the vertical vector by speed, and I increase y vertical position of the object by that, making the object move towards its destination position, factoring in the movement speed of the object. We are free to move anywhere around in 360 degrees motion, but we will restrict that because we don't want diagonal movement around the game grid. We will only allow the hero to move horizontally or vertically. If you are struggling to follow here a little, don't worry about it too much. It gets easier with repetition. After we move the object towards its destination position, we have to recalculate how much more distance the object has to travel. So we will recalculate the distance to travel x between destination position that hasn't changed and object's horizontal position that did change. And for the vertical y, we do the same thing. Now, here I defined distance as a let variable. If the object is close enough and snaps to position, we leave the distance alone. But if we moved towards the destination, we will recalculate that distance again using math.hypotenuse method we used before. And outside this block, we return that updated distance value. When we call move towards method, we pass it where we want to move and how fast. We calculate horizontal distance we need to travel and vertical distance we need to travel. And from there, we recalculate distance between the current position and destination position. If the distance is less than speed, snap to the final position. Else, calculate step we need to take. Update object's position, factoring in object's speed and recalculate the remaining distance then return that distance value. We know that when we call move towards method, it returns distance and we are assigning that returned value to this variable here. 
Now we want to know if the hero arrived to its target destination, to the target cell in the game grid. If the distance between the current position and the destination position is less than speed. Only if hero arrived to its target destination, we will run this code block listening for directional keys again, because I want destination position to only be able to move one cell away where the hero currently is. Then hero will animate to that position and only then we are able to set new destination cell. This will result in smooth motion in the end, just bear with me. <laughs> we will also create a debug layer later that will visualize this so we can see exactly what's happening. We are setting next x and next y to the current destination position every time this method runs, for every animation frame. If the hero arrived, we can move destination position again. If we press up, next y will move up by one cell in the grid, by tile size. We are importing it here, from here. If we press arrow down, we set next y to one cell down vertically. If we press left, we set next x helper variable one cell to the left. And if we press right, we set next x one cell to the right. After that, still inside this code block, we set destination x and y to next x and next y. Hero is still moving very fast. I stop multiplying these values by tile size here and here. And I set the starting position to 0, 0 to make the hero align with the game grid perfectly. These values here are actually pixel values, so I need to work with increments of tile size if I want the hero to stick to the game grid. Starting cell on the first load can be one horizontally and two vertically. We count from zero here. Hero character now animates smoothly and it will never be able to stop in between cells in the game grid. When we release a directional key, hero will not stop immediately. It will finish its move to the target destination cell first. So this code block, we have destination position of the hero, the X and Y position in pixels, where we want the hero to move, somewhere in the game grid. We call custom move towards method that takes destination and speed and it moves the hero towards that destination and it returns the remaining distance after the hero moved towards destination. We calculate the distance to travel on the horizontal axis and on the vertical axis and then we calculate the actual distance between two points in a 2D space. In this case between this dot position where the hero currently is and destination position where the hero wants to move. If that distance is less than the speed the hero is moving, we snap to the final position, finishing the move. Else, if there is more left to travel, we calculate horizontal step, normalized vector, very small value between minus one and plus one that will give us left or right direction. We calculate vertical step, this will let us know if we need to travel up or down to move towards the destination. Then we scale those movement vectors by hero speed and we add that step value to hero's position, actually moving the hero towards its destination. Then we calculate the remaining distance to travel after hero moved and we return that distance. That distance is used here to help us determine if hero arrived and finished the move to the next cell in the grid. If it did, and only if it did, we react to arrow keys being pressed again and based on the direction that we are pressing, we allow the destination position to be moved one cell away from the hero again. At that point, distance will be more than speed, so this check will fail. We moved destination and hero hasn't arrived, so we won't be able to move destination position further away until hero catches up. If you look at this visual, this is what's actually happening. The blue square under hero's feet is its this dot position property. The cell outlined in yellow is the destination position. We are only allowing destination to be one cell away from the hero. We will actually write the code to visualize this later in our project as well. Notice that even when I'm holding a key down like this, destination position just jumps from cell to cell. It doesn't run away far away from the hero. Let's have a look at this. I know that move towards method doesn't actually change the value of destination position. It only changes this dot position property, which means that this code can be simplified if we are going with the way I implemented it here. 
I don't really need these next x and next y helpers here, do I? I will have another look at this later in the optimization section and we will clean it up. Well done if you got this far. This is a major important technique to understand if you want to build the grid-based games. Click the like if you found some value and let me know in the comments if you know what game you will build with this. Time to have some fun now. Let's create many different characters together and choose our favorite one. Then we turn it into a sprite sheet and we will animate it. I will leave a link in the video description to this awesome site called Universal LPC Sprite Sheet Generator. Let me show you how to use it to create hundreds of completely different pixel art game characters. Then you can make your own and we will use it for the rest of the video. If the site is not available in the future, I will leave some alternative art assets that you can use to follow along with this class instead. You can download them in the description down below. I will also show you how to share your character in the comments section below. You can share what you created with others, especially if your character looks very different from the one I will make. This is a crazy tool that makes prototyping your games so much fun and so much easier. I have no idea what I want to make, I will just look through the options and make it up as I go. We start by choosing from six different body types. I will go with male, but feel free to choose whatever you want. I noticed that the shadow creates small issues where the edges of the shadow bleed into the other frames, so I will say no shadow here. We can easily draw our own shadow in game separately if we want. Notice that as I select these options, the generator is creating a unique URL here. This is important if you want to share your character with others. We will get back to this. You can choose your body color, but some later choices will recolor the entire body to make it match. We can give the character wounds, tails, we can choose many different heads and ears. How about furry ears? Side wolf ears? Fur white to match the body? If you have time you can explore all these options. You will find many surprises and unexpected cool things all over the place. It's good to always check if the things you select look good on your character and you can also preview the animations by selecting a different row in this drop down. Some of these animations are for weapons and I didn't select any weapon. I really like the special set of heads we have here for rabbit, lizard, orc, goblin, alien, troll. You can do so much here. Some of these special heads are not compatible with other types of head appendages, so be careful and always check the preview on the right to see what it looks like. I will create a pale vampire for my game. We can choose feathered wings, bat wings, many different colors as well, Monarch butterfly wings. Ah, these don't get replaced. Interesting. I remove these. What is lunar wings? Oh, that's a moth. Dragonfly here with a non transparent and a transparent version. I really want to use wings on my character just for fun, but the way I'm building this specific project we have a challenge. My game grid is 32 times 32 pixels, but these sprite sheets are 64 times 64. I can scale them down to match the game grid, but if I want to keep them at this size, I have to be very careful how I design the game world and where I allow my character to move, because I want to prevent clipping like this. This would not be an issue if game grid and character size was the same, but I prefer the character to be a little bit bigger than one cell. I like when the character is larger than a single cell. There are many ways to solve this. Today I will go with the easy solution. I will choose a character style that sticks out vertically, but it doesn't reach too far to the sides horizontally, so the wings don't clip with trees. We can choose clothes for different body parts as well. You can create a knight in an armor with a sword here if you want. I will just give my pixie vampire some pants. Notice that something is breaking the advanced animations, probably the fact that I gave my character wings. These are not shown on some of the more advanced animation rows, but in this game the character will not be climbing walls or watering plants, so in this case I don't mind. If you need all the animations to work for your game, you need to make sure all the parts you choose for your character support all these animation rows. For this project we want a character with a basic animation set, so we are all good here. 
As you build your hero from individual pieces, you will get a list of different authors that created them. You can download the credits here. Always remember to credit the authors. If you look here, the first part of the URL is always the same and from here we have parts of the string that show my unique choices. Body is white fur, head is vampire. Each block after an ampersand symbol is a choice I made. If you remember, I selected a shadow and then I chose shadow none. It registered that in the URL, but we don't really need that. I'm not choosing any shadow. If I remove that, the sprite sheet stays the same. If you choose some options to try them out and you remove them by selecting none, it will add that to the URL string. So I also remove this. I remove this. We don't need any of that. The character will look the same if I remove all of the none settings. You can share what you made with others, but YouTube's comment section doesn't allow links. And if you share your character by copy and pasting this entire URL, the comment will probably get automatically removed by the spam filter. So it's better if you take only the end after hash question mark symbols and I can easily try your character by adding that to the beginning of the URL on my end. I hope some of you actually share your creations with me. I'm really looking forward to that. We have the sprite sheet ready. I can just right click it and save image as. Now let's just add it into our project and animate it. I take the hero sprite sheet we created and I put it inside my project folder, inside images subfolder. I name the image hero1png, include it here and I give it an ID of hero1. If the image is outside assets div, we can see it, but we want to hide it, so I put it inside here. This div has display properties set to none. So this is the hero class. We know it extends and inherits everything from the parent game object class. Game object class constructor expects a single argument. It is an object, a configuration object with four supported configuration settings. Let's focus on this one. I called it sprite. I move the image property first. So sprite object is the image we want to draw, the hero sprite sheet, and x, y, width and height of the area we want to crop out to display one of the sprite sheet frames. As the character animates, these x and y values will be changing. Image, width and height will always stay the same. This is just the default sprite object that gets set up if we don't pass any sprite value to the configuration object. We know what that object should look like. I copy this and we will actually pass it to the hero class constructor here as we create it, like this. I will put each property on a separate line. We point the image to the sprite sheet we just created. I give it an ID of hero1, I put comma here. The sprite sheet we generated has a frame size of 64 times 64 pixels. So here I want to take this image and crop out a single frame of 64 times 64 pixels from coordinates 0, 0. That sprite object gets passed as a part of configuration object to hero class constructor. Hero passes that value to its parent class, so it goes here and game object class will destructure sprite from this. It will create this dot sprite property and since we are passing sprite value, this value here will not be undefined and it will take over. So this will go here and the default value here will not be used. So now we have image and x, y, width and height of a single sprite frame saved in this dot sprite property on game object class. Down here we are drawing the hero as a simple black rectangle that perfectly matches a single cell in the game grid. Let's make it blue. I need to keep this rectangle, it will be important when we get to collision maps. Hero will be standing in that rectangle. After I draw it, on top of it, I will draw and animate the hero from the sprite sheet. Built in canvas draw image method, it takes a minimum of three arguments. The image we want to draw, so this dot sprite dot image, and where we want to draw it. Add the position of the object, so this dot position dot x, this dot position dot y. I put these on separate lines again. We are drawing the entire sprite sheet with all the frames now. 
Draw image can take optional fourth and fifth arguments to define width and height. If I set those to match tile size, we are squeezing the entire massive sprite sheet into an area of a single cell. Probably you can't even see the image now, so let's scale it up five times. Cool. So these two arguments are for stretching and scaling. To do this, we will need to use the longest version of draw image method that takes nine arguments. The image to draw, source x, source y, source width, and source height to define which part of the image we want to crop out. And destination x, destination y, destination width, and destination height to define where on destination canvas we want to place that cropped out piece onto. We are storing the single frame cropping data inside this dot sprite property, so I want to crop a single frame from this dot sprite dot x, this dot sprite dot y. And I want the width and height of the crop to match a single frame in the sprite sheet, 64 times 64 pixels. We are storing these values as this dot sprite dot width and this dot sprite dot height here. I don't want these to be scaled up anymore. Okay, now the hero is too small. I want to make it slightly bigger. I want to scale it up. If you remember, each game object expects this scale value here. If there is no value passed in the configuration object, it defaults to one. So each game object in the project will have this dot width property. How wide do we want to draw it on canvas? We want the base size to match the sprite width, the width of a single frame in the sprite sheet, and we want to multiply it times this dot scale. If scale is the default one, 64 times one is 64. It will just stay at the base size. We will also have this dot height, which will match the sprite frame height times the same scale value. We want to multiply width and height by the same scale value to keep the aspect ratio. We don't want to be stretching or squeezing the hero image. We don't want that image to be distorted in any way. Down here as destination width argument, I use this dot width. Destination height argument will be this dot height. Perfect. We are drawing the hero image. We are setting a cropping area and we are placing that on canvas. I will copy this block. I set stroke style to yellow. We will stroke rectangle. In the previous lesson, we learned how to implement smooth grid-based movement between where the hero currently is, this dot position, visualized here by the blue rectangle, and where the hero wants to move, the destination position. I want to visualize destination position by outlining that destination cell in yellow, so that we can easily see how it actually works. We will stroke that rectangle at this dot destination position dot x and this dot destination position dot y. Ah, now the yellow stroke style applied to game grid as well. So I copy this line. I open world.js file. And here inside the draw grid method, I set stroke style to black. We have a nice visual representation of how move towards method handles hero movement. This will be helpful soon when we define collision cells. But first, let's properly position the hero sprite sheet. This blue rectangle is the cell that the hero is currently occupying. The yellow highlight is where the hero wants to move. I want to position the hero sprite sheet over that blue rectangle. I can move the image horizontally by offsetting its destination X property here. I can see I need to go a little bit negative. To correctly position the hero in the middle of the blue cell horizontally, I have to keep in mind that images and rectangles on canvas are drawn from the top left corner. So this is the top left corner of the blue rectangle, plus half tile size, and then I offset that by a half of the sprite frame using this dot width property, which already accounts for the current scaling value if we defined any. To save a little bit of performance, we can pre-calculate our values. Instead of calculating this for every animation frame 60 times per second, we can calculate it just once. We want half of this size. I export constant variable I call half tile. Here I will calculate it just once on the first load. We will store it here and export it. In game object JS file, I use that half tile value instead. I need to make sure I'm importing it here. 
we can also pre-calculate this value rather than recalculating this over and over 60 times per second. After we calculated this dot width and accounted for the scale, we create this dot half width property and we do that here. And down here, we use that pre-calculated value. Okay, this still works. I also want to offset the hero in relation to the blue rectangle vertically. This will have to be handled a little bit differently because I want the hero's feet to match the bottom of the rectangle and the head of the hero can stick out on top as far as it needs to go, depending on the current scale. I am keeping in mind that rectangles and images on canvas are drawn from the top left corner, so I move that origin point to the bottom of the cell plus tile size and then I offset it back by the height of the entire scaled frame, like this. That seems to have worked. Hero is standing where the blue rectangle is. The image is going a little bit over it to make the hero properly blend into the game world. This will work really well with layers as well to make it look like the hero is walking around the trees, rocks and obstacles. We will get there soon. We know that each row in the sprite sheet is a separate animation. For example here we have walking left, walking right. We will jump between rows using source y argument passed to draw image method. This property will store just the number of the row we want to crop out and we will jump around the sprite sheet in the increments of 64 sprite height, the height of a single frame in the sprite sheet. So if I want to go to row 5 on the first load, I can define that here. This is a big sprite sheet. I check mine and I see that row 11 is walking right, so I want to start with that on the first load. In Hero.js I can come to this code block. If input last key is up, I want to jump to row 8. Let's see. Yes, that works. Down is row 10. Left is row 9. Right is row 11. If you are using a different sprite sheet, you might have to use different values here. Check your sprite sheet, find the animation row you need and use that value. You can always experiment and try different values here if you are not sure. As I move around, we are passing draw image method different source y arguments, jumping between different sprite rows as we need them. And hero is always facing the direction it is moving. If you look at the sprite sheet, jumping from row to row switches between different animations. Jumping from frame to frame horizontally actually plays these animations. We could create a hero animations system where we can select any row and it will play that animation. For now, I want to play only the walking animations. We will need to track how many animation frames the sequence we want to play has. I can store that value on my sprite object. Or, to keep this simple, I will put it on the hero class itself. If you are interested to learn how to implement a more robust character animation system that can handle animation rows with different frame sizes and maybe even give each frame a custom delay, so that for example this frame stays a bit longer to match the sound effect or something, I can make a special deep dive episode on that. Leave a comment to let me know if you are interested in that. Today I'm going to do a much simpler and easy to explain implementation. Basically I want to cycle through the frames on each animation row over and over. In the case of walking animations we have 8 frames. We count from 0 here. We want to cycle between frame 0 and frame 8 over and over. In this block we are handling the vertical sprite navigation. Down here I will handle the horizontal sprite navigation. I need to be careful about the brackets in this area, it's easy to get an error. I will use a ternary operator. It's a one-line if-else statement. You can use a regular if-else syntax for this if you prefer. If this.sprite.x is less than max frame, increase sprite x by 1. Else, set sprite x back to 0. Expression to evaluate. If true, question mark, do this. Else, colon, do that. This code block just cycles from 0 to 8, so the cropping area is moving by 8 pixels. We actually want to jump by the increments of frame size, so as we did here, this value that cycles between 0 and 8 times this.sprite.width. This is source x argument passed to draw image method. It determines the horizontal cropping area. 
That's better. Now we are animating the walking sequence in any direction. It's animating very fast. I can do a simple fix and say something like only jump to the next frame every fifth cycle of animation loop here. But that would not be the best practice. The best practice is to time everything in our game based on milliseconds, based on the actual time that passed, not on how fast our computer can animate the frames, because that can be different on different machines and different devices. Request animation frame method has two special features. First is that it automatically adjusts the speed at which it serves animation frames to screen refresh rate. Some of you with high refresh rate screens can see even faster animations because what I'm showing you here is 60 FPS, 60 frames per second. For that reason, because people have different screens and different devices, we don't want to time the animations based on frames. We want to count actual milliseconds, the time that passed. That way the animation speed will be consistent on all devices. I will create a helper variable called last time. It will hold the timestamp from the previous animation loop. We want to calculate delta time, how many milliseconds passed since the last loop. The second special feature of request animation frame is that it automatically generates timestamps. All you have to do is to assign them a variable name here. The timestamp value is the number of milliseconds since the first call of request animation frame in this sequence. Delta time is the difference between the timestamp from this animation loop and the timestamp from the previous animation loop. Delta time tells us how long it takes for our computer to draw one animation frame, how many milliseconds. It will depend on the screen you have plugged in in most cases, unless we are for example overloading our project with too many sprite sheets and that is increasing delta time, slowing down the animation speed. Once we calculated delta time, we set last time to the current timestamp so that it can be used again as the old timestamp in the next upcoming animation loop. I open browser console and I console log delta time. You can see that for me it's around 16.6 milliseconds. It takes my computer 16 milliseconds to draw one frame. 1000 milliseconds divided by 16.6 is around 60. I'm animating at 60 fps. If you have a high refresh rate screen, you serve more animation frames per second. Your delta time will be lower and your animations are running faster. So let's make sure everything animates at the same speed on all devices. I pass delta time to game render method as the second argument. On the game class, I create three helper properties. Event update that will periodically switch between true and false. Only when it's true, we will allow certain repeating events to happen. We can use this to trigger all kinds of events that happen in regular intervals. I will use it to determine how often I allow the sprite sheet to jump from frame to frame horizontally. We will use event timer to count milliseconds using delta time. It will count over and over from zero to event interval value. Let's say I want event update to switch to true every 200 milliseconds, five times per second. So I need a code block that will use event timer and event interval to switch event update between true and false every 200 milliseconds. If event timer is less than event interval, we keep increasing event timer by delta time. Else, when event timer is more or equal to event interval, set event timer back to zero so that it can count again. Event update will be false. It will only switch to true for that one animation frame every 200 milliseconds. I get an error that says delta time is not defined. I'm passing delta time to render here on line 65. I just need to make sure render expects that value up here. Now I can console log event update to check if it worked or I can just go straight to hero.js and I say only if this.game.eventUpdate is true only every 200 milliseconds, run this code block that jumps from frame to frame horizontally. And I can see that it works. We can try different values to see what feels right. I will go with 60. If you want more precise time measurements, instead of setting event timer back to zero, we can set it to a remainder between event timer and event interval to account for that extra leftover value because event timer will usually overshoot interval value a bit and currently we are discarding that by setting it back to zero rather than accounting for that leftover value. It's not a big deal, it's just something you can do if you want more precision. 
we don't want the hero to walk on spot like this. We only want the play walk in animation sequence when the player is moving. I create a property called this.moving. Initially I set it to false. Since we only have walk in animation here so far, I can say that we only want to update frames if the player is moving. Now we need to determine when the player is moving. We only store directional arrow keys in input.keys array, so I can say if the length of that array is more than zero, we know the player is pressing a directional key, or we have this arrived constant here. It means the character is at its destination position. So, or if arrived is false, if the hero is still walking towards its destination, in both of these cases we set moving to true. Else set moving to false. Now we are only animating when the player is moving. If I look at the sprite sheet, the walking animation is actually from frame 1 to the end. Frame 0 is just standing. The legs are a bit spread out, so I only want to animate between frames 1 and 8 here. Else, if this.moving is false, we want to display frame 0, the idle standing frame. We just did a few things that kind of hard code the walking animation into the hero class. This would be perfectly fine if you are making a game like Vampire Survivors or some kind of a tower defense for enemies that are walking around. If you need a hero character with more flexible animation set, there is a more robust way to implement all of the hero animations we have on the sprite sheet. The best approach would be to implement a state design pattern here and create a separate state for each hero action and automatically play animations specific for that state hero is in. I might make a special class on that if people are interested because it's such a useful technique to know. Let me know if you want it in the comments. So we want to time animations and events based on actual milliseconds because timing things based on the number of animation loops that happened is not consistent across devices. We have delta time here, the number of milliseconds that passed since the previous animation loop. We can also use that to determine how many pixels per second the hero moves as it moves from cell to cell in the game grid. We can actually scale the movement speed of any object in the game by delta time and that way we can determine how many pixels per second we want that object to be moving which will be consistent across different devices regardless of the frame rate. It's quite simple to implement, let me show you. I pass delta time to hero update method. I make sure that the value is expected here. We will scale the speed by the value of delta time because we know that on slower machines delta time is higher on faster machines, delta time value is lower. It takes less time for that fast computer to serve one animation frame. So I can simply multiply speed by delta time and I can adjust the speed value to something that is reasonable after testing it by trial and error. Or even better, let's say I want this value, the speed, to determine how many pixels per second will the character move. I do that by multiplying the speed by delta time divided by 1000 milliseconds in brackets like this, because one second has thousand milliseconds. We want the ratio between delta time and one second, and then we apply that ratio to the speed value. Delta time is one animation frame. We want speed per second. We scale the speed, making the speed value match the one second range. Then we use that scaled speed here and also here. And now the hero is moving two pixels per second. <laughs> That's too slow. Let's try 500 pixels per second. The advantage here is that the hero now moves at a consistent speed on all devices because we scale the speed by millisecond values. I think I will go with 100 pixels per second now. We can scale the size of the hero sprite sheet up and down. Right now we are not passing it any scale so it defaults to 1, the base size. If I pass the hero configuration object an optional scale value, I just want to check if we implemented the hero sprite sheet correctly. Hero should always grow from this origin point, from the bottom middle of the blue rectangle. I will do something very obvious. Five times the scale, hero is huge now, that works. Of course we will not use this, but you can see that the hero is still moving from that blue rectangle at its feet. Perfect implementation. <laughs> It is useful if you want to do something more subtle, like scale it 80% of the size. This could actually be something useful. 90% would look like this. 
120% of the size will look like this. You can see that the scaling works well and the hero's origin point always sticks to the bottom middle of the blue rectangle at its feet, which will be important for the next part of this class. Hero can still walk off screen. Let's make the trees and the rocks into actual solid, impassable obstacles. Let's define a collision map, cells in the game grid, where the hero can and cannot walk. If you watched the other episode on tile maps where we create the game world from individual tiles, this is actually the exactly same technique. And it's fully compatible if you build your world using these tile map arrays here, for example. I just add another array to my level 1 object. I will call it collision layer. It will be an array. I know my game world is a grid made out of 15 columns and 20 rows. I will create a grid of numbers here. 15 columns like this and 20 rows like this. I need some more. 18, 19, 20. We have the representation of game grid here. 15 columns, 20 rows. Zero means hero can walk into that cell. One means it's a solid cell that we can't walk into. If I put one here, I want this cell to be solid. If I put one here, I want to mark this cell as solid. If I put one here, I'm saying hero can't walk through the rock in this cell in the game grid. I hope it's clear what the goal is. How do we actually implement it? Exactly the same way as if we are drawing a tile map from this array. I create a helper get tile method. This method will take an array we want to search through. So maybe world.level1.collisionLayer array, for example. This method is reusable for other things. Then it will take a row and a column. Let's say we have this cell in the game grid. I know which row and which column it sits in and I want to check the collision layer array to see if it holds 0 or 1 at that index corresponding to this cell to determine if this cell is solid or not. So we want to return an element at a specific index inside collision layer array. For example, index 10 would be 0. It's this element. So how do I get that single index value when I know row and column, but I don't know which index in the array it is? It is simple because of the fact that we know how many cells per row we have in the game grid. We call that calls, columns. We know our game grid has 15 columns, 15 cells per row. So to get that single index value, we first account for all the completed rows. Number of the cells per row times the current row we are on. Let's say we are on this cell. So this bit will account for this area, plus that little bit we have left over on the last unfinished row, which is plus the current column. So let's say we are here, cells per row times row number, plus whatever is left. It will give me this index value, and that will take me here. And I check what value we store in the array at this index. If it's 0, we can move there. If it's 1, we cannot move there. It's a collision cell. We can visualize the collision map now. I copy this code block we used to draw a game grid. Orange red color. Fill style. Fill rectangle here. I will call it draw collision map. We are cycling through the game grid row by row from top to bottom. But we don't want to draw an orange-red rectangle for every cell, only for the ones that we marked with number 1. We will use our custom getTile method to check corresponding indexes in collision layer array to determine that. As I cycle over the game grid, I want to ask, is there number 1 for this cell in collision layer array? If it is, draw orange-red rectangle in that cell. We know getTile method expects the array we want to search through, so this dot level one dot collision layer, level one object here, collision layer array here. Then get tile method expects the row and the column we are currently in as we cycle over the game grid. So only if we store number one at index that corresponds to this row and this column, only then draw that orange red rectangle in that cell. That's it. When I call this method, I expect to see three orange red cells. Okay. Right. So I copy this. 
I go to render method on the main game class and I call this.world.drawCollisionMap and I pass it CTX. That worked, I see three of them. Let's give them semi-transparent blue fill. Now I will just mark the cells that I want to be solid. You can see that those tiles are being drawn at the exact corresponding position in the game world. I'm doing this manually because we are learning. I want this to be absolutely clear. We can speed things up by using some helper software. For example, Tiled. I used it earlier to draw the game world from a tile map and export separate PNG images for each layer. We can also draw the collision layer in there and Tiled will actually export JavaScript array that looks exactly like this. So if we use that tool, it's fully compatible with what we are doing here. I'm just checking my image manually and um, comparing it with this array and I'm deciding which cells are solid and which cells are free for Hero to move into. I will mark all solid cells with number one and I will color them in blue. If you want me to show you how to do this with Tiled, which is a free software that anyone can install and use, let me know when I can make another episode about this if people are interested. Because probably if your game world is much larger than this, it will be quite difficult to do this manually as I'm doing it right now. I have some more cells down here. Tree, rock, and another rock. I want to make sure that Hero can't walk into the blue cells. Right now, Hero can still walk off screen, but we will prevent that. It's easy now, we already wrote all the logic. I can simply go to Hero update method. Notice that we save destination position X and Y, the cell where the hero wants to move, into these helper next X and next Y variables. Then, if we press directional keys, we move next X and next Y accordingly. We will only allow next X and next Y to be assigned back to destination position and actually make the hero move if the cell we are trying to move here, if the cell is not marked with number one on collision layer. So we move these to a new cell in the grid. We determine which column we are on after we update it next X. We determine the row after we update it next Y. Then I call getTile method that sits on this.game.world because we are calling it from hero class now. That method expects array, row and column. I want to check if this.game.world.level1.collisionLayer array, which we have here, accessing it through this.world reference on game class, if this array for the row we are trying to move to and column we are trying to move to, if it isn't one. Only then we will allow next x and next y to influence the destination position. Otherwise, this move, this entire part will be completely discarded if the cell is marked as solid in collision layer array, because next x and next y will be overridden by the unchanged destination position values in the next animation frame. I hope it makes sense. There is quite a lot happening here right now. If you are a beginner, don't worry too much. It gets easier with repetition, I promise. Well done, guys. Click the like if you found some value and let me know what else do you want to learn. How about hero picking up and holding different objects or changing clothes? I don't know, leave some comments and I will plan the next episode. We are drawing a lot of helper graphics, all these grids and highlighted cells. They help us to develop the project, but we also want to be able to hide them easily so that we can see the final game. I only want to show them when we are in debug mode. This dot debug will be false at first. Helper toggle debug method. When called, it will set debug to its opposite value. If it's true, set it to false. If it's false, set it to true. I will handle that here inside input.js file. Right, so else if key that was pressed is enter or key that was pressed is spacebar. Feel free to use different keys here if you want. Call this.game.toggledebug from here. The problem is I don't have access to this.game from the input class here. So I make sure it expects game as an argument. I convert it to a class property pointing to the space in memory where we store the main game object. 
we are not creating a copy here. We are just pointing towards an object somewhere in the memory. And here, when I create an instance of input class, I pass it this keyword, which points towards this entire game object so that we can access toggle debug method I wrote here on line 41. Again, I can write a console log to check if debug switches between true and false when I press enter or spacebar. But I might as well directly say, if this.debug is true, only then draw game grid. Debug is false on the first load, so this happens. I press enter or spacebar and we toggle debug mode on and off. Perfect. I also want to draw a collision map only in debug mode, like this. Now we can see the game world much better. We know there is a lot of grid-based logic happening behind the scenes, but we are no longer visualizing that. We just have a nice forest game scene. I only want to draw the blue rectangle and yellow destination position highlight if this.game.debug is true, like this. I can now show and hide the debug mode visuals by pressing enter or spacebar on my keyboard. We can quickly toggle it on and off. If I look here, these two cells should be free. There are no stones or trees here. I mark them with zero. Ah, I have to press enter to see the debug layers. Zero here as well. I can now walk into this small opening area. We should now understand this code base and we can edit it and adjust it however we want. You can make it your own if you want. Create your own hero, create your own world, create your own collision map. You can also watch the other episode on 2D camera and implement that. It wouldn't take that much code to do that. What kind of adventure will you create for your players? Let me know which technique was the most useful for you. Did you learn something new today or you already knew all these techniques from before? Let me know in the comments. Do you want to learn more and finally bring your own unique pixel art game you have been thinking about into reality? Then you should probably know how to do this. I'll see you in the next class.